And we're live. Great. Welcome back to Elasma Week, everybody. I'm your host for the week, Dr. David Schiffman. Elasma Week is an online outreach event about the science of elasma ranks, shark skates and rays, and the scientists who study them. And this week is all about diversity. The goal is to highlight the diversity of scientists, the many ways of doing elasma rank research, and to show off as many weird and wonderful species as possible every year. Elasma Week wants to make a platform where real scientists can share their love and work with the public. And it is my pleasure this evening to introduce to you Dr. Marianne Porter, who is an assistant professor of biological sciences at Florida Atlantic University. She's originally from Arizona and received a PhD in biology from the University of California at Irvine. Her research has taken her from the Grand Canyon studying native plants along the Colorado River, building autonomous robots to study evolution, and now based in Florida, studying the biomechanics of marine animals. Dr. Porter joined the, the faculty at FAU in 2014 and founded the Florida Atlantic Biomechanics Lab, the Fab Lab, where she is currently training three PhD students, two master students, and many wonderful undergraduate researchers. She recently received a prestigious National Science Foundation Career Award, which supports early career faculty who have the potential to serve as academic role models in research and education and to lead advances in the mission of their department or organization. Current research in her lab includes understanding shark skin stretchiness, lionfish spine puncture performance, and examining shark swimming using 3D techniques. Take it away, please, Marianne. All right, thank you. So hopefully this will all go well. And you can see everything, right? Okay, so thank you all for having me. I am really excited to be sharing my research with you. And I just wanna say that this is the research that's going on in my lab. And it is my distinct privilege to be able to train young new scientists. So I am working very hard to train, um, train my students to be excellent scientists. And at the same time, they're also training me to hopefully be a good mentor. So. We have a lot of great work going on in the lab and I wanna share it with you today. So we're the biomechanics lab. And what that means is we study how animals move. We use engineering and physics to think about how animals work. And humans have been inherently interested in this for a really long time. Aristotle was writing about the movement of animals 300 BC. And many of you have maybe, may, probably seen the great pictures drawn by Leonardo da Vinci uh, about the human body and Borelli's pictures of the human skeleton as lever system. So we're gonna think about some of that today as we explore sharks. So again, we're using physics and engineering to understand how these animals work. So big questions motivating my research. I like to know how animals move and how does the underlying skeleton allow that to happen? And we can answer this question a few ways. And our research is funded by the National Science Foundation now, and we're able to really explore the biological materials that make up a shark. So we're going to be studying cartilage and shark skin. Today, we're gonna to focus on the cartilage though. We also look at the mechanics or how these pieces are put together and how they work as a system. And then finally, locomotion. When you think about these biological materials and put them into an animal, arguably sharks are some of the coolest animals, we're able to think about how an animal moves. So today I'm gonna to tell you about skeletal elements. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about shark cartilage and what I've learned so far in my career and the things I've gotten wrong and where we're going. We're gonna talk about how to study swimming in three dimensions. And we're gonna talk about studying swimming in the wild. So first I wanna say this is work that was done with my recent uh, graduate student, uh, Dr. Danielle Engel. And so I wanted to acknowledge her here. Um, when we're thinking about the skeletons of sharks, many of you know, we're thinking about animals with skeletons made of cartilage, right? Very different in terms of tissue from our bone. But I've been studying shark cartilage for a while now, close to 20 years, and I've learned a few things. 
So first, the cartilage is really, really stiff and strong, and it behaves similar to our bone, even though it's cartilage. So it's a fundamentally different tissue. It's made of different cells. Another cool thing I've been able to show is that each little vertebrae, so if you look at our shark skeleton here, you can see the jaws of the shark here. Hopefully you can see my arrow. Um, this is a horn shark from California, so you can see the nice spines co coming off the end. And you can see the vertebral column, these repeating elements right here. And so what I've been able to show before is that each little vertebrae can operate as a spring. And what that means is the vertebrae can compress and then return to its original shape. And that's really cool because if you remember back to your early physics classes, springs are able to deform so they can store and return elastic energy, which can be, which can be really useful if you're an animal swimming around in the ocean. So we know our vertebrae can work at springs. We've also been able to show that they can act as a break. So sometimes these vertebrae can help the animal store energy and sometimes they can damp it, damp the vertebral column and act as a little bit of a break. One of the limitations of my studies before I started working with Danielle is I was really only focusing on one area of the vertebral column. So I was focusing on the vertebrae right under this first dorsal fin. I was really focusing on just one area of the shark that's where I was able to get a lot of specimens from. And so that's where I was looking at them. So that was one limitation. You can see that this whole body has vertebrae going through it. And, you know, different things might be happening in different places. Under the first dorsal fin, we've got a lot of visceral organs. As we move further down the shark, you might think this could be the business end of the shark in terms of swimming. We might be needing to generate thrust here um, for fast swimming. So where I had been able to study these vertebrae was the limitation. Another thing was I squished all these vertebrae till they broke. Many of my studies in the past, I have tested these vertebrae till failure. And if we're a material scientist talking about failure, we basically squish something or compress it until it breaks. And it breaks in a rather spectacular fashion. You know it's definitely broken. Um, but in life, a shark isn't going to go around squishing its vertebrae till they break. That would be a terrible idea. So in life, a shark is moving around, compressing its vertebrae, um, usually around four to 8%. So it'll change the length of the vertebrae just a little bit as it's swimming to activate that spring. But I've been able to measure that in real swimming sharks but I haven't been able to look at a wide variety of specimens or species to kind of see what happens when they squished just a little bit. And any of you who have played with Silly Putty know that when you squish something, if you smash it really spectacularly, especially with something like Silly Putty, you can get some different kind of patterns going through it than if you do something slowly to it. So the goals of the study were to look at the front and the back end of the shark. Pretty simple, right? Um, we think the vertebrae near the back would be important for generating thrust as those animals swim. We were going to smush them just a little bit to see how they compressed and how they might work as springs during swimming. And we wanted to see if mineralization matters. So we've got this big amount of mineral that shows up here. So this is an x-ray and everything that's mineralized is glowing and showing up at you. And in your own bones, when you have an x-ray, they show up because of all the mineral in your bones. And the same thing happens here in a shark. So we were wondering if the mineralization patterns that vary among species really mattered too. And the last thing we were able to do is look at small, medium, and large sharks from a variety of species, because everybody wants to know what's up with the baby shark, right? And so we were able to look at this suite of things, small, medium, and large sharks, the front and the back of the shark, squishing it just a little bit, and if the mineralization pattern mattered. So those were some of the things we were thinking about. So what we did in our experiments was we took individual vertebrae, and we smashed them. So 
imagine these two brown plates are hooked up to a giant machine that can smush stuff um, to the tune of 2000 Newtons. And so one of the ways we can kind of visualize a Newton is to imagine picking an apple up and holding it in your hand. That's kind of the force of a Newton, um, so we like to say. So if you imagined having 2000 Newtons or 2000 apples dropped on you, um, that's what we can do with this machine. So we put our vertebrae in here and we are able to smash them. Now remember, I used to smash things till they broke. It was a very satisfying feeling, but now I really want to explore what happens when we squish these springs just a little bit. And I wanna tell you about two things we were able to measure. We were able to measure something called stiffness. And we use stiffness all the time, colloquially in our language, but as a material scientist, it really means having the ability to resist compression. So if you're able to push something and it's the ability of that material to resist your compression that we're measuring. The other thing we were able to measure about these was their toughness. Again, a word we use colloquially, but in materials, it means the ability of that material to absorb energy. So what we were able to do is look at the front and the back of different sharks. And you can see the species we used in this study here. We have a dusky shark, a blue shark, a common thresher shark, a white shark, a short fin mako, and a poor beagle shark. And this is work that was done in collaboration with Dr. Lisa Natanson at NOAA. And it was our collaborators that were really great at helping us get some of these specimens. And working on animals like common threshers and white sharks, makos and poor beagles was really amazing and really fun for everyone in my lab. So what we were able to show, remember we're looking at the front and the back of these sharks, is that stiffness and toughness were both greater in the posterior body. So it seems like the back end of the shark is working differently in terms of mechanics than the front end of the shark, which makes sense, right? We were talking about how the back end of the shark might actually be the business end. It might be where they need to generate thrust to be able to swim efficiently as they're doing those lateral uh, body undulations and moving through space and time. So maybe being able to have this extra stiff and tough material at the posterior part or the back end of your body, you're able to provide efficient energy transmission to return these um, swift swimming apex predators. So we're able to get that swiftly swimming shark um, to be able to keep doing its job. The other thing we were able to show Remember we were interested in those baby sharks? Here we have our groupings on our x-axis and we have um, these different symbols. So Y-O-Y means young of the year. Those are our baby sharks. We've got immature sharks. So these are sort of our teenagers and mature sharks. These are your professor sharks. Um, just kidding. So here on the y-axis, we have toughness that ability to absorb energy and the ability to resist compression. And what we found was both of these properties were greatest in our young sharks. And so this was really weird and made us think that there might be something going on mechanically with the skeleton as these sharks are getting older, like maybe we always kind of thought they were adding more mineral, so more hard bits to their cartilage as they grew, but maybe there's something else going on with how they're building their vertebrae. So if we look at our vertebrae here, we can see we've got a lot of variation in these vertebrae. So remember, we wanted to know, does the mineralization pattern matter? And in our study we just did, we found that both stiffness and toughness go down with changes in mineral arrangement um, based on the angle. So as our angle right here changes and increases, stiffness and toughness go down. And in the study we were able to do, we were only able to look at that really crude estimate of our mineral arrangement. We decomposed the entire thing into just one angle. 
But here in these CT scans, so now we're talking about if you went to the doctor and got a CAT scan, we're able to look at 3D mineralization. So we essentially take a stack of x-rays and can create 3D images um, and movies to understand how shape looks. So in the study we just did, we were able to look at that one simple angle. But if you look at these, we have three different species here. We have a blue shark, a great hammerhead, and a short fin mako. And right off, you can see the short fin mako looks way different than the other two. And so we have all of these plates here. Um, there's a lot going on here. And we can see that we've got a little bit of waviness here um, in our hammerhead, whereas it looks like solid chunks here in the blue shark. So just eyeballing it, we can see that these pictures look a little bit different. And our new work that we're doing now and what we're trying to explore now in far more detail is using these CT scans, these um, CAT scans, similar to what you might get if you went to the doctor, um, being able to look at a whole variety of species and look at really intricate mineralization patterns and correlate that back to how those mechanics of that spring works. And this is a really exciting collaboration for us because the CT scanner we use as it is at the high school that's located on the Florida Atlantic University campus. So we're able to have a wonderful opportunity to collaborate with our colleagues over at the local high school and also um, the high school students who go to school over there. And I have several of the grad students in my lab working together on this new project. So, um, you know, if I, if I come back and give a talk next year, you'll probably know more about how this mineralization works. So that was our skeletal elements. That's thinking about how the skeleton works at a very mechanical level, which is well and good and obviously something I can talk about for a very long time. But one of the greatest things I think I get to do is put all of that mechanics back into a swimming shark, which is one of the most beautiful things to watch swim around. So now I wanna spend some time telling you what we've been able to learn recently about how sharks swim. And this is gonna feature some of the work that I've done um, with a former PhD student, Dr. Sarah Hoffman. And here you can see um, her work was featured on the Journal of Experimental Biology. So we're gonna start off talking about her paper um, that she did on hammerheads and bonnethead sharks. So here you can see our hammerhead swimming around a tank. I can learn an awful lot by watching a shark swim <laughs> for a really long time. We can do this a couple of different ways. We've got these sharks swimming through a tank. We can do tethered swimming. So sometimes we can hold an animal in place and watch how it swims. And this, uh, uh, is the way I have been swimming during our COVID quarantine shutdown. The pools are all still closed here. So I've been swimming in place in my backyard. It's very boring and would not be my favorite way to study a shark swimming, obviously. So we can have these animals swimming around. We could tether them. Another thing that we can use in terms of technique is we could use what's called a flume. And this is like an underwater treadmill. And so if you've ever gone to a gym and you've had someone, your gym buddy, you trust your gym buddy, right? You let them pick the speed for you on a treadmill. Does this end well for you? It really depends on how uh, wily your gym buddy is feeling that day. I personally wouldn't let anyone pick my, my speed on a treadmill, mostly because I hate running. But if we are scientists and we put an animal in a treadmill, we get to pick the speed. And that may not be reflective of how an animal is swimming. So we're able to use these really large tanks that we have at our marine lab and be able to study animals swimming um, basically volitionally. So they do what they want. And we're able to learn a lot about them. So here we have our hammerheads. And you can see that if we were to measure the pixels that made up this hammerhead, it would be a lot of points, especially in high definition, high resolution video. 
I can do an awful lot with math, but that is a lot of points. So one of the things we can do is we can deconstruct a really complicated animal shape into some points that are a little easier to track and, and uh, look at. So we can de decompose potentially millions of points into a few key points or areas of research. In this study, we were really looking at how hammerhead swims. So you saw the hammerheads that swim by in the tank and we were comparing them to a bonnethead shark. And the cool thing about this study is we're looking at hammerheads with a very large hammer and bonnet heads. So bonnet heads are the hammerhead species that just has the little shovel shaped head. So they're not quite as, um, I guess, glamorous as our really big hammerheads that we see. And so one of the things we were really trying to do is understand how these animals were swimming with these big things on their heads. And much like I did in my previous study, I was interested in what was happening in different regions of the body. Is there something going on at the head end that is different from the tail end? Because remember the head end of the hammerhead has this giant platform that it's dealing with, right? The big hammer. And the back end of the shark is going to be the end that needs to be doing the swimming. So what we were able to do is we were able to track all of these points. Here, I just show you the head and the tail of our hammerhead specimen here. And here you can see that the tail in red has a really nice sinusoidal wave. And we can see that it has a very dif different amplitude from the less obvious wave that we're getting from the head. So um, we're seeing some different things just by looking at our data. And in fact, what we found was when we compared these two species, the bonnet head with just the shovel shaped head and our hammer heads, we were able to show that they swam at the same velocity. Um, so they're swimming at the same speed. And one of the things we can do to measure swimming efficiency showed that they were swimming with similar swimming efficiency. And what we did find though, was that both of the species, the hammerhead and the bonnet head, wiggled their heads at a greater frequency than the rest of their body. So they're basically setting up a double oscillating system, which is really cool when you think about how fish generate the wave down their body for swimming. And so this is something we hadn't really ever um, seen before or thought about much when we think about shark swimming. So that has really changed a lot about how I'm thinking about what's happening um, when a shark swims now. So we were able to show that the wave at the front of the body and the wave at the back of the body are different. And another thing we were able to show is that the bonnet head sharks flex their body with a greater amplitude. So the body is going back and forth at a greater amplitude than the hammerhead but the hammerhead is going back and forth at a greater frequency. And so that was also really cool because remember these animals were swimming at the same speed. So we have animals that even though they're swimming the same speed are modulating their bodies in different ways to get to the same point. So our bonnet head is modulating amplitude and our hammerhead is changing frequency. And that was really cool. I learned a lot from this study and this is another area where we're continuing to work on studying how sharks swim. But this gives me a really 2D view of the animal, right? Two dimensions. I'm looking at it from top down here. I have just this view. That's great when I'm looking at a shark swimming across a tank. But if you've ever been to an aquarium or gone scuba diving, you know that fish don't just swim straight, right? A lot of times they're up and down in the tank, they're doing different things, and oh my goodness, the complexity when they start to turn and swim around faster. Um, so many things can happen if you're looking in 3D at what's going on. So Sarah, um, Dr. Hoffman, as part of her dissertation, really wanted to see how sharks are using their pectoral fins in maneuvering. So a lot of what we think about in sharks, we don't really think about the pectoral fins moving that much. Anyone who's been diving or watched sharks in an aquarium says, of course they move. But 
we haven't really explored that much about that in terms of actual science and data collection and being able to show how they're using those, especially when we're looking at maneuvering. So the next thing we wanted to do is figure out how to study shark swimming in 3D. And Sarah was able to work with our colleagues at Tufts University, UC Irvine and Brown University um, to start thinking about how to do this. And what they did was they developed a technique called visual reconstruction of moving morphology. And they essentially did what we do in movies. So a lot of times if you see a movie or a video game that has um, characters in 3D, again, remember if we look at an animal or a human, they're composed of a whole bunch of pixels in our high definition video and a whole bunch of points that are really difficult to track. So a lot of times what we do in a movie is we have our actors wear the, the plain colored suits with the dots all over them. And then we decompose their complicated movements into just these cloud of points. And then we start to build it back up. So we make our stick figures and then we can animate in the actual movements. And so what Sarah wanted to do was she wanted to see if she could do that with a shark so you might think, well, we've done it a whole bunch of times in humans already, so it should be super easy, right? Anytime you try to take any technology or anything underwater, there's an extra layer of complications and excitement because water, especially seawater, is super wild on electronics and you know any sort of technology. And we also needed to convince our sharks to do what we wanted them to do. So here's some video of a bonnethead shark swimming in one of our experimental tanks. And a few things you need to see here. Um, uh oh, my video stopped. Oops. See if my video will play again. Here we go. So we've got our bonnethead shark. We've got four little coral heads that create a square on the bottom of the tank. And that square is one side of our cube. So imagine those coral heads each extend up to the surface of the water. And we create this cube of water that was carefully calibrated using three dimensions um, so that we could calibrate every little space in that cube. Now we have our bonnet head shark that it's swimming through and you can see it has tiny little dots all over its body. Now it turns out to be very difficult to find a bead that is just a hemisphere. Beads are usually round, right? So we had to figure out a way to put beads that would stick really well. That's why we wanted hemispheres onto a shark. And what Sarah came up with um, after searching for hemispherical beads was googly eyes. So my graduate student at the time um, was at the store and bought, you know, the thousand pack of googly eyes and then took them home and spray painted them. We're back to the lab. So now we have our shark that is wearing googly eyes. And the way we affix those googly eyes is we're able to use um, vet bonds. So very similar to if you have to go to the doctor um, say you cut yourself making dinner and you need to go to the doctor. You don't quite need stitches. They're just going to use the glue. Basically the same glue we used for our shark. We were able to um, work together, place a whole bunch of dots all over the shark's body, and it was good to go. We would put it back in the tank and we would use our uh, little mop stick there to kind of direct the shark to swim through the area where we had our video cameras. Um, and one of the questions I always get was, well, what happens to the shark? Because it's wearing all these dots. Remember that if you touch a shark, it feels like sandpaper because it's got all those dermal denticles all over its body. So even though we glued all these dots onto our shark, they usually started to fall off after an hour or two, um, which is also when our video camera started to run out of batteries. So all of our experiments lasted for as long as our video would last and as long as the dots didn't fall off our shark. So then we had to clean up all of our googly eyes from the bottom of the tank too. So that's our setup to be able to look at this. And 
Again, what we call this is video reconstruction of moving morphology. Here you can see a still picture of a spiny dogfish shark with um, the coordinate system. So the stick figure we started to draw to look at how the fin was moving in this shark. And a really amazing thing about this technique is it's open source. So we were able to publish Sarah's papers as open access. So any of you out there can download those papers anytime you want. Um, this technique uses XMA Lab, which is highlighted in this paper here, which is also a free open source software. The cameras we were able to use and we describe in our papers are GoPro cameras. So any researcher around the world who wants to study shark swimming will need a tank, they will need their sharks, and of course all their approvals to work with live animals, but they will have access to um, the software um, and they can use commercially available or consumer available GoPros to do this. So we're really excited that we were able to share um, this method with everybody. So with our animation software, we're able to take the dots of our shark. So now here's the video from our dogfish sharks. And we can see our animation moving alongside our shark. We move our shark away. And now we can hold our shark still and see what happens. And so we were able to show that the bonnet head sharks depress their fins and speed up through a turn and the dogfish sharks depress their fins and sweep it forward a bit. And so what does that mean? Um, here we have our possible ways that our fins could move, our little um, bonnet head shark. And we found that the fin depressed more um, as they would turn and increase their speed through a turn. So it's almost like if you've ever watched the Winter Olympics and you've seen the speed skaters kind of put their hand down, um, they're able to kind of create that pivot point, which is what we think the shark might be doing in the water. The other thing we were able to show is we were able to show which muscles are activating different actions in the shark. And so we were able to show which muscles are being used as the fin is moving up and down, which was a layer of um, physiology that we didn't really know um, before we did this study. And this study really opens the door for some cool work to look at how sharks swim and also the ability to understand and study their maneuverability. All right, so that was swimming in 3D. Now we want to think, how do we study sharks swimming in the wild? What could be better than studying a shark swimming in the ocean where it lives? Um, we've been able to take advantage of some of the other work going on at Florida Atlantic University, where um, Dr. Kajura from the FAU Elasmo Lab has been flying aerial surveys up and down the coast to study the black tip shark migration that happens um, in South Florida every year. He's been studying these sharks for about 10 years from the air, but from an airplane. And I thought, you know what would be really cool is if we could get a closer look at these sharks and study how they're swimming. And so um, this is featuring the work of my current PhD student, Braden Ruddy, and he uses drones. Again, another commercially or consumer available product. You can go buy them at Best Buy. So he tosses his drone up, goes to the beach, and sees what he can see. And so you can see there are some people here and we've got lots of sharks in the water. We are able to watch our sharks swimming. And if you remember back to the beginning where I showed that hammerhead swimming around in the lab, you can see that some of this looks really amazing crisp video and we can see our shark and analyze it in the same way that we were able to analyze the shark swimming in the lab. So what we're able to do is get video of these sharks swimming. Now, not only can we see one shark swimming, but now we can study all these sharks swimming together. We can look at sharks swimming by themselves. We can shark look at sharks swimming as groups and start to really understand what the kinematics or how the body moves 
when they are doing um, these migrations or swimming in large groups. And we use the same technology we did before. We're able to track the points on the shark and start to analyze um, those amplitudes. So how far from the center does the shark's body move in different areas? We're able to look at the frequencies. So how many peaks you see over a certain amount of time. And this is really cool because we have not been able to think about how animals swim in the wild um, when we're thinking about sharks. Um, all the biomechanics we've done has been animals in the lab, animals swimming in flumes. So um, there's uh, another paper on mantas that has done this on wild, wild elasmobranchs, but um, again, not, not much work has been done. So we're really excited to build on that work and start to think about how these animals are swimming in the wild. And here you can see, there are a lot of these guys we can look at. As they're swimming around, we can look at how close they are together, how they're maneuvering, and what is going on with them. Um, let you guys watch this for a moment. It's very pretty video. This is courtesy of Dr. Kajura at FAU. And you can see these sharks are near, um, they're near shore. We can use our drones to study them. The water is very clear. The bottom is a nice sandy color. So the sharks show up really well when we're flying the drone over them. And it's really um, clear, shallow water that makes it easy for us to study. Again, we can think about how these animals are moving by themselves. We can think about how they're moving together in a group. And we can think about how they're moving with predators. So here is a photo from uh, Doan and Kajura this year, which was a paper that just came out earlier this spring where they were able to show that these black tip sharks right here, right here, and right here, when they're being chased by a hammerhead right here, go up into this shallow water to refuge. And so now we have drone video where we're able to look at how these black tip sharks that hang out and aggregate in South Florida in the winter, how they swim, but we're able to look at how their predator swims too. So we can get the predator by it itself and we can get these really close interactions where we can see how this predator and prey are swimming and um, really start to understand biomechanics in the wild in a way we haven't been able to look at before. And so with that, I'd like to wrap it up and thank um, some of the many people who support my lab and myself. Um, again, we work a lot with the FAU Elasmo, Brat, Elasmo Lab, um, so Florida Atlantic University and the Elasmo Brink Lab. Um, we're able to go out on the boat with them and share field work, um, which is really great and convenient and a good way to get all of our students a lot of experience. I would like to thank our funding sources. So um, the Elasmo Lab is uh, funded by the Colgan Foundation, and my lab has been funded now by the Save Our Seas Foundation and now the National Science Foundation. So we have a lot of great support. This work can't be done without the support of our federal agencies. I collaborate with scientists at NOAA. Um, we have um, FAA approvals for all of our drone flying. And of course, we're in Florida, so we have to um, acknowledge and thank our collaborators and colleagues at Florida Fish and Wildlife um, Commission because they're always super helpful and supportive of our work. And lastly, uh, many scientific foundations support my students' work. Um, by helping them go to conferences, um, supporting some small grants for students. So I'd like to acknowledge the Marine Technology Society, Society for Experimental Biology, Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology, and the National Sea Turtle Foundation. Um, everyone um, has been really instrumental in helping us. And remember, um, my goal is to be training excellent shark scientists and uh, training myself to be a mentor with the help of my students. So with that, I'd like to take any questions or uh, Dr. Schiffman can direct me to what he wants me to do next. Great, 
thanks, Marianne, for that great talk. Uh, we're do, we are doing uh, questions Sunday evening, which I guess is tomorrow now, with everybody all together. Right. Uh, so if anyone has any questions for Dr. Porter, I encourage you to please leave them as a comment on the YouTube video you're watching here. Tweet them at Elasma Week or tweet them at Dr. Porter. And I also want to remind you that we have another Elasma Week talk coming up right after this uh, on the same YouTube channel. Uh, so thank you very much, Marianne, for that great talk.